Hello and welcome to another Liverpool.com podcast. I am Dan Morgan. I'm joined by Matt Addison and Mark Wakefield this week, gents. I hope you're well. We've got a lot to get through. It's been a week, to put it mildly, uh, in the Liverpool support and sphere, if we like. But firstly, um, I want to bring you the results of our survey last week. So we're going to run some simulation pieces on Liverpool.com. Bear with me with this. I did explain it. But if you haven't seen the piece, the concept is that to celebrate or to mark 10 years of FSG at Liverpool, celebrate the wrong word, and I'm probably going to get panned in the YouTube comments for that word. But to mark 10 years of FSG at Liverpool, we have basically set up a set of written pieces um, charting the most important decisions that Fenway Sports Group have had to make as Liverpool owners. Now, within that, we started last week by asking you what would you do with Fernando Torres in the January of 2011. And the votes came in and the majority with 150 votes and 71% of the vote was sell Fernando Torres and buy only Luis Suarez. The other options were keep Torres, buy Andy Carroll and make sure Suarez is the priority next summer. Um, Sell Torres, buy Andy Carroll and Luis Suarez, which eventually played out. That only got 11% and keep Torres and sign nobody, 6%. So with that, you have chosen your own reality for the next piece, which will be up on Liverpool.com on Thursday afternoon, late evening, um, maybe. We don't know yet. We haven't decided on a time, but it will be up on Thursday and it will be the knock-on from Liverpool, therefore selling Fernando Torres to Chelsea and buying only Luis Suarez and you have picked your reality and I will give you a clue early. There are some harsh harsh, harsh changes to history that you won't like in that piece. But give it a look and vote on the next um, the next instalment, if you like, which is um, which is on there and, and available for you to vote in the survey box. So swiftly moving on, um, gents, we've got a lot, of, lot to get through given uh, the nature of the week, as I've mentioned. I think, look, I think a reflection on the week, first and foremost, Matt. Um, I think Liverpool are being tested um, massively under Jürgen Klopp. You know, there was there was the Aston Villa debacle, which now seems like a lifetime away. Um, the international break, which followed, and then the absolute chaos that ensued at Everton. You know, he's going to need his mentality monsters now more than ever before, and he's going to have to harness sort of the spirit of Klopp in a way like, not, not in a way that he maybe hasn't done before, but, you know, in a way that we've seen he can do. Yeah, I mean, first of all, there you, you mentioned the Aston Villa result there, and I thought actually Liverpool's performance against Everton generally was an example of exactly that. It was that mentality monster, as it was yeah. that bouncing back, because they were, you know, but for large periods of that game at Goodison Park, absolutely exceptional. Not, not least the, the goal, the, the pass. Uh, we all know what happened after that with the, the VAR offside and things like that. But I thought generally, you know, Liverpool did look absolutely brilliant and. Suppose, as you say, now they've got to, to sort of do that again. We know that Liverpool came into this season with only three fit senior centre backs. They now only have two. I would argue that you know Fabinho is uh, as good as, or even better than Gomez and, and Matip. To be honest, on the evidence that we've seen, so yeah, mentality monsters. It is time for them to, to step up again. I think they don't need any motivation for that. I think that the injury to, to one of their best mates, one of their teammates, one of the, the key people over the last 18 months to, to, to two years in Virgil van Dijk. I don't think anybody doubts that. Um, I think you know, the, the motivation is there for these players now to go and, and prove not only that, that they can win without him and they're still a top class team, which I think they are even, even without him in the team, but also that they can win it for him. Uh, he's obviously now going to miss at least the majority of this season, if not the entirety of this season. We know that that is a fact. As hard as it is to move on from that, I think the the players almost have to, to separate themselves from the emotion of it to an extent. And, and just as I say, go and, and prove themselves that they are a Liverpool team just as much you know, without Virgil van Dijk as what they were with it. I think it's easy to forget sometimes, Mark, that you know, in my opinion, this isn't a Liverpool team which has defended well for the past year. Um, probably nine months if I'm being kind but I don't think they've the evidence is there that they have not defended great and they've got the best centre-back in world football and the best goalkeeper in there now 
a lot's being made of that, you know, through punditry, tactically, etc. Um, but that is a team, you know, that is a team that gets beat 7-2 with Virgil van Dijk in it. So there are solutions that can be made with and without him being present in this team that can that can improve. We're going to get onto it in a bit that we've seen a little bit of that last night with dropping that line and stuff like that. But a life without Van Dijk, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's a good one for the time being, but it's one in which Liverpool and Jürgen Klopp can definitely sort of take stock and find a different way to sort of approach defending with this team going forward. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's certainly not a better life without Van Dijk. That's pretty obvious to say, but it's certainly one that I think Klopp will thrive on. You know, he thrives in adversity. He thrives in basically proving people wrong. He's pretty much done that since day one, walking through the door pretty much. Um, we've seen, you know, the amount of players that have been written off pretty much and Klopp's turned them around and basically turned them into fan favourites or even arguably club legends with some of them. So, you know, it is going to be a very... It's obviously going to be a tough time. That's pretty much obvious. Um, but certainly going forward, like you say, the defensive um, issue is that certainly, I mean, to product restart as well, that that's pretty much, you know, can't take that too seriously. But like you say, towards the back end or before the lockdown, you know, they were conceding goals, not so much left, right and centre, but they were let, weren't keeping clean sheets to their standard like they were over Christmas and New Year. So it's going to be an interesting time. We're going to see Fabinho much more at centre back. As Matt said, in my opinion, he's probably better than Matip at this moment in time. He's certainly a better option. He's certainly more reliable in terms of fitness. So, and Gomez, you know, I think he's certainly, well, certainly number one centre back at the club now with Van Dijk injured. So, for them two going forward, if they can stay fit, that's going to be a big boost going, uh, for the rest of the season. But yeah, it's certainly going to be a time that Klopp will look to thrive on as, as he has done before. I mean, I, th- I suppose. We we need to get onto the centre back issue in general, Matt. I think I think there's a there's a huge question around what he does with Fabinho for me. I mean, whether he just commits to him as a centre back from now until what is going to essentially be the end of the season. Um and he uses him in rotation with someone like Joel Matip, who I think has gone around a year to the day. Um since well, whenever Manchester United away was last season, since he completed 90 minutes in a Liverpool shirt, um, you know, calendar book ends and that with Everton um, last week. So I think, you know, it's 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 a situation the club has to sort of firefight and, and manage accordingly. But I think there are obvi- there are obvious benefits to Fabinho at centre back. We've seen his performance last night. He's he's got that sort of front footed nature that you sort of liked in Dayan Lovren, but you were always a bit worried could could sort of spill over. He seems to have sort of a calm head. His reading of the game, his positional sense is, is really good and, and really astute, it seems. Um, and I think another thing that you get that, you know, is being passed up a lot, we've wrote it on Liverpool.com, is the fact that you're going to lose that long and searching ball with Van Dijk that can sort of, you know, as Michael Arteta said, get you out of a press or get it to the chest of, of Mo Salah from 60 yards. And I think for me, the um the closest thing you've got to that is, is Jordan Henderson. So it could enable Henderson in the six if he stays fit. I mean there are tons of of, of different contexts around what he does at centre half. Where are you with it? Yeah, I mean first and foremost on the the sort of long ball thing into to Mohammed Salah's chest and things like that. I think we saw last night that was very much a deliberate tactic. I think they tried to get Joe Gomez to to do that against Ajax. Obviously he can't do that to the same extent, but I do think you know Fabinho will help that in terms of, you know, going forward and, and rotation. And I think there's just so many games at, at this moment in time, I think at least until January, when Liverpool can potentially sign a, a centre-back. And I'm sure that is something that will get discussed between now and then. If if the right person is available at the right price, I'm sure they will go and do that because I think, you know, long-term they would have needed to, to add one next summer anyway. You couldn't go forward with just the, the three of them anyway. So maybe, you know, you, you bring that plan back by about six months. But in terms of, of between now and, and then, I think you, you do commit to, to Fabinho. I think you have to say that, you know, Matip, as you say, that the evidence is not there that he can play a game every three days for a period of, what, two months, just over two months. You know, the, the chances of that happening are absolutely zero, in my opinion. So I think you, you just have to, to rotate between Gomez, Matip and Fabinho. 
I don't think uh, Matip and Gomez have ever started a game together alongside each other for Liverpool. So that's going to be a new partnership. Fabinho, you do lose out in the midfield. It's not ideal. But I do think between the three of them, they can sort of work it out between you know, now and, and January as a short-term fix. I think the fact that Liverpool have got Thiago and, and Jordan Henderson in that midfield helps. I don't think you miss Fabinho as much as what you would have done last season because you've now got a world-class operator in that number six who can, can step in instead. It is a, a bit of a shame for Fabinho that he's got to sort of sacrifice what you presume would be his favoured position for the team. But, you know, that's just the, the way it goes at, at times. And I think, you know, certainly up until January, that's just the way it's got to be for now. I think one thing we do see against Ajax, Mark, is, you know, that there's definitely, it was picked up in the media, the line dropped in quite a bit. And I'm happy they did, to be honest. I think sort of trying to maintain the position and the shape tactically without Van Dijk is it would have it would have constituted, you know, a form of of absolutely. Um, I mean, look, it's it's. I go back on myself a little bit here. It's 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 maybe easy enough to say that in certain games, you know, West Ham's of the world. On, in a week or so time that, that you can get away with stuff like that. But there's going to be games, especially, you know, in Europe, crazy teams like Atalanta where, you know, you are going to have to sort of adapt and play the game in front of you. And dropping back in last night at a place like Ajax in Amsterdam just gave me a little sense that there was an air of sort of conservatism, but also, but also pragmatism in terms of Liverpool doing what they needed to do. That being said, you know, I think it's, I think it's clear that maybe there's, there's an element that, the front three maybe have to suffer a little bit with this in terms of them not being in on goal, bearing down on opposition goal, sort of as quick and as and as high up as they would like. You know, I think there's a there's a couple of times in the game where I'm watching it and I'm thinking to myself, they look a little bit sort of lethargic in the final third. But when you consider it, when the more I was looking at it, the more I was thinking they're having to sort of take on an extra 15, 20 yards in carrying the ball because the line's dropped a little bit because of midfield's getting bypassed. I mean, you can put the pitch into that last night. I think the pitch was a bit was a bit of an issue and I think Klopp mentions that. But I suppose the question I'm asking is, do you think there's sort of a a short-term suffering in, in the attacking that Liverpool are going to have to put up with for, for the sake of making sure that they're a bit more solid? Um, possibly. I mean, you're right in that. Um, certainly dropping back was the right thing to do. Certainly in the short term, especially <clears throat> excuse me, after them conceding nine goals in the last two league games, albeit seven coming in one against Villa. But yeah, I think you certainly saw they did look a bit lethargic up front a little bit with like Salah having an extra 10, 15 yards to try and either take on the fullback or sprint to try and get into the box. Mane the same. Firmino dropped a little bit deeper as well, so he wasn't in as much of a goal scoring threat. I'm not sure how many shots on goal, if any, he had last night. Um, but then again, with him, that's not out of the ordinary. But yeah, in terms of going forward, I think it is probably more, uh, they've got to be a bit more pragmatic because I think Klopp learned a couple of years ago that, you know, they've got to keep clean sheets if they want to win games. Simple as that. You can't rely on outscoring oppositions uh, too often. It's what got them to the league last year. It's what them got into the Champions League uh, the year before that. So yeah, in terms of short term, I think certainly probably until. Christmas and January beyond, they're going to be a bit more pragmatic going forward. Um, that being said, you know when you have quality players like Salah, Mane, Firmino, you know, dropping back five, ten yards, you know might hinder them a little bit, but you know they've still got enough talent there to cause defenses problems. And I can't see it being there being many one nils for Liverpool going uh, certainly between now and January. I think they have to sort of get back to that, Matt, though, to be honest. I think, you know, you sort of... I think what you see against Ajax, what particularly pleased me, the last half an hour was Liverpool from sort of 12, 18 months ago in terms of just killing the game and that ability to to absorb, but to also, you know, counterpunch a little bit with the opposition and let them know that, you know, if, if, you, if you try and sort of walk us down, then then we'll be able to spring on you. We'll be able to counter-attack with the quality we had on the pitch at that time. And, you know, people like Jota and Minamino seem to thrive in that situation. Um, but that is that is a sort of trait of Liverpool going back to sort of peak 18, 19, early 19, 20, when they were able to sort of shut down games on their terms. I think the goalkeeper will be a big, a big 
helping that. I think when Alisson comes back into the side, I think that ability to sort of play games on their terms will, will be a lot more sort of in their favour. I mean, I'm going to come on to to Adrian in a bit and it's going to be a difficult conversation for both of you. So I'll just pre-warn you for that. But um, but just in terms of sort of shutting down the game, I thought they were really good last night, Matt. Yeah, it was very much a part of the game plan. I think obviously you saw Jordan Henderson, uh, the physio, I think, uh, had said to Liverpool's backroom team, you, you know, you can only play him for, for 45 minutes. So that's what they did. They played Curtis Jones for the first half, brought Jordan Henderson on at the interval. And, and I think that was, you know, very much part of, of that plan to control the game, make sure it, it didn't get too crazy. And I think obviously the, the threat on the counter attack is always going to be there. The difference now is that, you know, without Man. Uh, Mane, Salah and Firmino on the pitch, you, you still had that threat, as you said, with you know Jota in particular, I thought looked good. I thought Minamino had a, a couple of decent moments. If you know Liverpool can make a couple of different changes and, and still have that threat, it, it allows you to control the game in a way where you're controlling it, but you don't lose that threat at, at the same time as well. So you sort of need both of those things. I mean, just in, in terms of the control, the, the more pragmatic approach, if, if you like, I think it depends game by game. I think against Ajax, you you look at the players that they've got in attack. I think Tadic is a, a really good player. David Neres as well caused a few different problems on the night. I think against them, it, it makes sense to do that. I wonder if Jurgen Klopp will do the same thing. For example, at the weekend against Sheffield United, they're not probably going to come to Anfield and, and go all out attack and, and try and make it you know, an entertaining game. They're probably going to sit in and, and try and defend and, and try and counter themselves. So, I think it will depend game by game how pragmatic and, and how controlling Liverpool try and be. But it was good to see that they do still have that. You know, for, for the teams that they need to use that against, they can use that as a tactic. Do you think you see four two three one Matt in in any of the games coming forward? I was slightly surprised we don't see it last night, although, you know, Curtis merits his start. And as you say, there's there's the medical advice on Henderson. So he probably knows he's got forty five in him. To do that, I think it's probably wise to play him in the second 45 rather than the first, because then he gets the warm-up, he gets to go back in, he gets to get assessed. And then, you know, it's going to be hard getting him off the pitch at half-time if you start him. So there's all that context. But I think you, I think you wouldn't be surprised, would you, if, if you see 4 2 3 one in the next few games and someone like Jota or Minamino playing from the start. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly concerned about Minamino, if I'm honest. I think, I think he's got every attribute there, to be a Liverpool player, but I don't, I don't think, I don't think he's going to, in the short term, succeed playing in that in that Firmino role in that Bobby role. I think whilst he's got his back to goal and whilst he doesn't have two three players sort of running in front of him as he's bearing down on goal, I think he's he's struggling to adapt to that to that four three three shape. Whereas I think if you put him in a four two three one, sat him behind someone like Salah, I think you definitely get to see more of the sort of the Minamino that we we believed we were getting when we signed him. Yeah, number ten for for me is is Minamino's position in that four two three one, and yeah, I, I do think it will probably be a four two three one at the weekend. The question then for Minamino is is it going to be him that, that gets that opportunity to play in that position? I'm not sure it will be. I think Diogo Jota is ahead of him at this moment in time, and I think the fact that all three of the front three came off with half an hour left last night suggests to me very much that all three of them will start on Saturday night. So then you're thinking, well, again, it's going to be an opportunity off the bench for, for Minamino, even when Liverpool have switched to a 4-2-3-1. It's you know, a case of, of him probably at best being the first substitute for the Premier League. So it is difficult for, for him to get himself into the team. But, but for, for Liverpool more generally, you don't want to focus too much on, on one individual player. For Liverpool more generally, that is you know a very, very good thing. I think Diogo Jota was, was promising. I think he probably did just a, a little bit more than the Minamino against Ajax and, and deserves his opportunity to play, you know, with the, the regulars and, and go from the start really against Sheffield United. But as I say, I think Liverpool can afford to go for it a little bit more. Obviously no fans in the stadium doesn't you know, quite equate to the same home advantage and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, that being the case, I still think Sheffield United are going to have a, a pretty clear uh, game plan, I think, of, of sitting in, defending, hoping to, to hit someone like Ollie McBurney on the, the counter-attack or, or from set pieces and stuff like that. So, yeah, particularly with Thiago hopefully being back for the weekend, I think Liverpool can afford to, to go for it a little bit more. And, you know, 4-2-3-1 for me makes a great deal of sense. 
Mark, what did you make of the substitutions? I know, I know you're writing something on it today. I think, for me, as, as much as anything, it's a statement from Klopp in terms of sort of the the vocal disappointment he's shown in it not being applied to the Premier League domestically. I think we're going to see a lot of this in European competition in these group games that you will see sort of three subs like that or substitutions which are already planned, clearly planned regardless of how the game's going, um, occurring throughout the groups. I think that maybe there's an interesting conversation in terms of those three coming on and whether they sort of will form the sort of shadow front three, if you want. I mean, there's no Divock Origi there. Harvey Elliott's now gone to Blackburn, as we know, for the season. So, yeah, I mean, what did you make of it in terms of its its context, but also its impact on the game? Um, well, first of all, I mean, I was quite surprised. I think like most people raised their eyebrows out, like all three coming off at one time. I'm not sure if he's ever done that before. Probably not, given that for the majority of the time he's only had three substitutes available. Um, we know that he's advocated for having five in the Premier League, didn't get his wish. You know, argue which side of the argument you want to be on with that, whether it's right or wrong. But yeah, in terms of the, in the impact of the game, I thought it helped. I think I think they all did their role really, really well. Jota, you know, we saw what it was about in the last couple of games. And he, I think that last night was probably his best best showing, to be honest. You know, taking players on, doing everything that we expected of him, but. You know, just see, you can just see his quality that he has, and you know, it's just so encouraging that if you know one of the front three, in particular Sadio Mane, isn't fit or available for whatever reason, that you have someone like Jota there who can pretty much replace him and not so much fill the void because you know Mane is a one one of the world can't, one of the best players in the world in his position. No one like him. So yeah, take, I'll take your point about Minamino. Didn't look quite comfortable with his back to goal in that number nine role. What Bobby plays. Um, I think he is his best position. He's a number ten with someone like in front of him who can so sort of run in between the lines a bit more, you know, try and be a bit more creative. Um we've not mentioned Shakiri that much. I thought he did quite well considering he's basically out in the cold a couple of months ago. Everyone was thinking he was going. He's out of the club. If you've got him, you might as well use him if he's fit. Um in terms of the impact going forward, yeah. I mean, it certainly gives you confidence that if one of the front three isn't fit or available for whatever reason, or if you want to give them a rest, given the hectic schedule that we've got coming up between now and January. Yeah, it's certainly encouraging. And, you know, it can only be a good thing that having these kind of players, not so much just available, you don't want them just sitting on the bench and then thrown into it in a random game in December when it's really cold and, you know, they expect them to do something that's just not realistic. So you've got to give them the game time while you can. And, you know, with these games coming thick and fast, you know, there's no better time to do that. Matt, I don't want to get into slaughtering any Liverpool player, uh, and I'm not going to, to be honest, but I think constructively it's clear that Liverpool defenders, Liverpool outfield players don't really know whether they're coming or going with Adrian in goal. I mean, the the, the incident on, on around two minutes when he comes and just basically empties the ball and nearly Joe Gomez and the luck he gets from Gomez... He was probably the nicest man in football, by the way, is is slightly concerning to me in that maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I I wonder whether there's a there's an element of him just burning their heads out a little bit. Like they're constantly sort of having to second guess what he's gonna do. And I think that's fair because I don't think he really knows what he's gonna do. So my point is not to slaughter him, not to get on his back. I think, you know. He pulls off a good save, a really good sort of instinctive save, and we've do, seen him do that time and time again. But I think it's fair and very reasonable to say that the sooner we can get Alison Becker back into this side, the better it will be. But also, I think that'll be the, the minute we start to see what a sort of life without Van Dyke really looks like for Liverpool in terms of shape and setup. Yeah, I think so. I think that's a fair assessment. It reminded me really of Simon Mignolet in the fact that he does some good things. As you say, there's a couple of decent saves in there. There's a couple of bits that you think, you know, that's a really, really competent piece of work from a goalkeeper. You know, you're really impressed by it. But then he does some other things where you just, like you say, the, the incident a couple of minutes in where he tackles his own player. You just think you could do without that at any time in the game, but particularly then when you know, players are starting to, to work their way back in. They're not too sure. And that, that was the way it felt to me. You, you saw when Mignolet was in goal that Liverpool did tend to drop in a, a little bit deeper. 
they did tend to pay it, play it a little bit safer. And I think that's what we're seeing at this moment in time. There isn't that full confidence and that full belief from the players in front of him. And look, that's understandable. It, it's understandable. Whoever you put in goal it is not going to be Alison Becker. Thankfully for Liverpool, it looks like he could be back now for, for the West Ham game. So there's only you know Sheffield United and, and then Mitchell next week who potentially that, that Adrian will have to play in. I think Liverpool will have you know more than enough to, to score a couple of goals in, in each of those matches. The issue with Adrian in goal is that, you know, last night's clean sheet was almost a little bit of an anomaly. You normally think that if he is in goal, Liverpool have to, to score two goals to win. I suppose the, the relief, if you like, for, for Liverpool fans is that against Sheffield United and, and Mitchell, and as I say, they should be able to do that and they should be able to, to sort of get through. And it's going to be really interesting, as you say, really fascinating to see how Liverpool tactically do change when Alisson comes back. Do they go back to more what they were when Van Dijk was in the team? Do they completely trust the goalkeeper behind them and Fabinho and, and Matip or Gomez, whoever it is at the back, to do the job in the same way? Or do they still play a little bit more pragmatic because there's no Van Dijk, even when you know the, the first team, uh, first choice goalkeeper is back? So look, either way, I think Adrian isn't as bad as what some people say. Um, but of course, it, it goes without saying that the quicker Alisson is back, the more relaxing it will become to be a Liverpool fan, I think. It feels like a massive game now on Saturday, Mark, doesn't it? You know, it's um, it's it's almost very quickly got back to that last season's must-win feeling. Um, City have got probably the test of the maddest Premier League side of all time in West Ham, um, but you'd expect them to win. Sheffield United are a big test regardless of how they started this season. And then there's the whole re and Brewster context around that. I mean, how do you see it going in terms of, of firstly, the game? I know it's hard to call, but in terms of just how the manager approaches it, does he does he look to make sort of wholesale changes? Is that is there a chance for the 4 2 3 one, or do you think it's going to be sort of as we would all expect? Um, yeah, I'd say it's a tough one to call. I mean, you know, given the front three all came off up, after just now uh, against Ajax, you expect all three of those to play in some way. Um, like I say, four two three one. If you can get Jota or Minamino in the side, that should be good going forward. Back four, I expect. Um, obviously, Adrian will, will obviously start with the back four. I you expect to be the same um, with you know Gomez and um, Fabinho in centre backs with Robertson and Trent. Um, Midfield's where it gets interesting. Thiago, we're not sure. Whether he'll be back, we don't know. If he is fit and available, you expect him to play. Um, Henderson, again, is another one you've nailed on star. He's got to start if he's fully fit, um, which hopefully he will be. And then it gives the question of, you know, do you give Junior Wijnaldum another go? Do you give um, Naby Keita, who we can get from the squad against Ajax? Um, Curtis Jones, again, who I thought did okay against Ajax, although you, know, you can see why he was taken off, obviously, for Henderson coming on. So... Yeah, it's going to be a, a tough game um, against Sheffield United. You know, we know what they're about. They're a very pragmatic team in the sense that you know if they're not that like, they haven't got the flair that clubs like Liverpool or Man City have. But you know they're very strong. They're very hard to beat. You know, with if they have someone like Oli McBurney up front, they're going to play. You think they're going to use his height and play for set pieces, which you know with Liverpool's defensive frailties, you know, no Van Dijk, Adrian and Gold, that might be something. That could cause an issue, possibly. We don't know, but yeah, Rian Brewster. You know, first, I say I'm a big fan of him. I was good to see him go. Whether he'll get a chance against us on um, on Saturday, that'll be interesting to see. Um, you know, personally, I want to see him do well, but just have a I'd like to see him have an off game just this once. But yeah, in terms of calling it, you know, there's many different options at Klopp's disposal. But it all depends on the fitness, particularly the fitness of Thiago, because I think if he's fit. You know, we could see it go back to the four three three. If not, then I think he might go with a bit more a different approach, like the four two three ones we've mentioned. Jordan Henderson definitely starts. I think Matt, but burden any problems. There's also Naby Keita as well, who, who seemed touch and go for this one, but didn't travel as a precaution. I think, I think you're probably going to see a little bit more wrapping in cotton wool, aren't you? From from sort of now until the next international break at least, you know, if there is sort of medical advice or someone's got a, a tiny bit of a niggle, they just won't risk them. But I think for this one, Liverpool should have a few more midfield options to go at. 
Yeah, plenty of different options. I think Naby Keita at a push could have played against Ajax if he really needed to. But as you say, there's no real point in in making a a change which you know could potentially leave him out, particularly with someone like Keita. You know that you don't want to rush him back because I think the the maximum number of games he's ever strung together for Liverpool is five. So it's one of those where you you don't take a risk with him. If he is back for the weekend, I'd be tempted to put him back in. But I think it, it's really difficult to to decide really because I personally would go with a 4-2-3-1. I think Jordan Henderson has to, to start and then that obviously only leaves you know one, one other option. If Thiago is fit, you'd imagine it'll probably be him alongside him. And then of course, you know, the, the Champions League game to, to come midweek again. It's a game that Liverpool will be expected to win. Mitchell lost 4-0 at, at home to, to Atalanta as, as Liverpool were playing. So I think that sort of shows that they are Certainly, as we expected, the the lowest uh, team in the group. I think they are going to finish fourth in, in the Champions League group for Liverpool. So Liverpool can afford, I think, to, to make a couple of changes and use their squad in, in both of these upcoming games. And I suppose that is the, the decision that you've got to make. For me, it, it doesn't too much matter whether you were to play Cater on Saturday or Tuesday, but I think he will play in, in one of them. I suppose you could say the same for Curtis Jones. For me, it, it's the case now at, at Liverpool, not necessarily having you know a, an obvious choice. It, it's just whoever is fit on the day, almost a, a horses for courses approach for, for the next couple of weeks, just because of, of how many games there are to come. So yeah, whoever Jurgen Klopp picks on, on Saturday, on Tuesday, and, and then against West Ham the week after, I'd be fairly comfortable that they can do the job in, in each of those matches. OK, just very quickly, what have, uh, what have you got to look forward to on Blood Red, Matt? Absolutely loads to come. Uh, before Sheffield United, we've got um, obviously our usual regular Blood Red podcast. Uh, Neil Fitzmaurice is back with Poetry in Motion as well. Uh, so there'll be a couple of decent guests on with him. I think Paul Gorst is going to be joining that one as well. So, yeah, podcast. <laughs> well, they're all decent. I shouldn't, uh, shouldn't probably I'm only, have, jo- uh, I'm only joking. Like Ghosty, no, Ghosty knows I love him, really. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, uh, I think uh, Gorsty and, and Joe Rimmer will be on that. So, yeah, plenty more podcasts uh, to listen to before Saturday night. Lovely stuff on Liverpool.com. We've got tons of writing, um, good writing to get you through um, the whole Virgil van Dijk context, the results against Ajax and Everton, still loads up from that. And we will, of course, be looking ahead to Sheffield United. They keep coming thick and fast. Um, Liverpool.com and Blood Red will be there every step of the way for you. We hope you've enjoyed this week's podcast. I've been Dan Morgan. Big thanks to Mark Wayfield and to Matt Addison, and we will see you next time.